Hey y'all, Data Guy here. And today I just wanted to make kind of a shorter video on what are the different types of web APIs, what are each of them best used for, um, and you know, how do each of them function, right? So a web API at its most base level is really just a set of tools and protocols for building you know, a software application. And it defines you know, the way different software components interact with each other over the web. So it says, if I submit this form, this API is going to take the information I put in that form, maybe my name, my uh, password, my email, and then that API is going to execute a function that stores that data in a backend database. Um, and so that's a really simple example. They can get much more complex, you know, querying information, creating an API can be used to create a new piece of compute. Um, and really the applications are endless um, because APIs are crucial for enabling, you know, different applications for communicating, sharing data, which then allows integration interoperability because you have these functions that are defined by code that you can then chain together to unlock new functions. Um, and so the first web API that I want to go into talking about is the REST API. So REST API, uh, which stands for represent representational state transfer, uh, is probably what most of you think of when you think of an API. Um, and REST APIs use standard HTTP methods like get, post, delete, um, and put that then execute a path, uh, something on a path that's defined via URL. Um, so they're completely stateless. So these URLs, while they contain you know, what that function is, they don't have to run anything to support that. Um, the actual execution happens when I post this request to this URL and then that information gets passed to the server, which will actually return me a JSON of information. So if I got get surveys, um, and then this server would serve me a JSON file that contained the information around that particular survey. Um, so this means that every time you want to you know, make a request, you need to have all the information contained within that request that you need to actually process this. Um, and these types of APIs are highly scalable since it doesn't require anything to be kind of standing up to actually sitting there processing for these URLs other than that individual server. They're really easily scalable um, because you can have many different people executing a get request on that URL at the same time and it doesn't require you know me to have a server set up for each of those get requests they can all be processed by that single individual server um, and they are really performant because they use existing http caching mechanisms um, and what that means is they use the existing kind of mechanisms which web traffic uses to save and serve you information uh, really efficiently uh, to actually save and serve you this information from these particular endpoints. So they're building kind of off the back of an existing framework. It also allows them to save a particular request and add information to, in that request in a cache. So if you have a bunch of people that are executing, you know, get surveys, it can save the information that it's using to that sending that first user and keep using that for all the subsequent requests so that each request doesn't need to go through the whole process of, hey, you know, now the server needs to find this information and then generate a JSON it will save that previous request and use it to serve to anyone else that makes the uh, same request. And this also, they support a variety of data, data formats. So even though I'm using JSON here, they have, they can uh, send information back out in XML or a few other different types. Now, some of the cons of this are, you know, statelessness can be either a blessing or a curse. Sometimes applications require a steady state. You know, maybe there's a game I'm playing and I execute uh, something on an API that, you know, says I shoot this person and then they shoot me, and then we should keep shooting each other. And that all needs to happen in one single instance of that application. Um, and so API, or sorry, not APIs in general, but what REST APIs don't really have that function. Each requests its own individual item code and thing that isn't going to take into account any previous version of that request other than that cache version of the request that's been created. Um, and then Secondly, is that they can sometimes over or under fetch data. So sometimes, it'll, you know, let's say you have a really large database um, and this J API is only set up to send you 10 of the latest database points, right? You'd have to execute that API request, you know, dozens of times to get all the information you need or vice versa. Let's say this API endpoint will just dump all the contents of a backend database and I have, suddenly have 400 pages in a JSON file that I need to read through it's you have to then write a function to actually parse that data just to find that particular data point you want if they're not fine-tuned enough. Uh, so it really is a balancing act of like, hey, how do I fine-tune this API to 
give someone access to a particular file while not just making it so limited that someone's going to, need to execute 30 queries to get a larger picture of the actual um, data. Now, the next API I want to talk about is a SOAP API, which is a simple object access protocol. Uh, these APIs use XML for message format and are protocol independent, so they can they don't need to run over HTTP. They can run over other uh, web transfer protocols, um, and they're really known for their strict standards and security. Uh, they have built-in error handling, support for security. Um, they have strict standards that you have to meet to actually be able to write a SOAP API request. So they're less freeform than a REST API, which then makes sure, hey, all of your APIs API requests and all of your API endpoints are going to conform to a particular format. So you know that they're, you know, of a certain standard when you're actually accessing them. And they can also be extended to meet more customized needs. Uh, so in this like really, really annoyingly grainy example, you can actually pack tons of information into, you know, result requests, have it all in a very standardized format. So, you know, here it's just a list of all the attributes of a particular user. Um, you can see you have your uh, SOAP API requests up here, where I'd say this is the uh, envelope that I'm getting, uh, this is the XML scheme instance. Um, and so you can see just a lot more complexity, but with that complexity comes, you know, a little bit more security, uh, a little bit more customization, hey, how I want to define how this information is actually spit out. Um, However, as you can see kind of from that example, and I'll just go back to it here, it's gonna be much complex, more complex and heavier than a REST API example would be. Um, you, know, you just have more to handle, you have with more granularity, you're just gonna, it's gonna contain more information and then thus it's gonna require more compute overhead. Um, and the verbosity of these XML files where you know, you're going user full name, pirate jack, user full name, user ID, user ID, and you have you know everything kind of bracketed in what the variable is what it is, it's just much larger messages, it can affect performance. Um, and so while this might be, you know, I don't even know about human readable, but more, sp more organized than a JSON request and more kind of standardized, it is more of a pain to kind of manage and requires more overhead. Um, it's just, you know, overall heavier than a REST API endpoint or request body would be. So if performance is like your main uh, measure of success, it's probably not the best option for you. Now, next up, we have the GraphQL API. Um, so the GraphQL API uh, is basically more, uh, it's developed by Facebook and it allows require a clients to request exactly what the data they need, um, which avoids, you know, over and under fetching and allows you to really contain many sub requests in a single GraphQL request because GraphQL treats requests as objects. And so in this example, you know, you have a request for, hey, I wanna get all the information around Ada Lovelace, right? And so to get all that information, if I needed to make individual uh, API requests, I would have to, you know, number one, from an API request to DynamoDB uh, to get their you know, basic profile information, hit their API gateway to get some you know, information around their different orders. Then within that API gateway, you don't have to hit the Lambda and Amazon Aurora to actually get more information around uh, what their underlying purchases were. Um, and so you're basically batching a series of different REST API requests within a single GraphQL uh, API request with this approach. Um, so these you know, pathways are already defined when you write that GraphQL endpoint to pull from all those different subsystems, which then reduces the need for multiple requests and gives you much more control around what data um, you need. So you can say, hey, I want a specific object, which has been defined to contain these various subsets, and you can get exactly that piece because you can query for, you know, Ada Lovelace specifically or their ID. Now, obviously, you know, this is going to require more complexity to actually set up and implement than REST because you need to kind of tie in all these different subsystems into a single higher level uh, object that contains them. Um, and the caching is more challenging just because the dynamic nature of these queries, you know, maybe you're the only one that's ever gonna look at Ada Lovelace for the next 30 years, but someone else might, you know, have some greater overall, they wanna get Ada Lovelace and 20 of her friends, right? Um, and so when you have these more complex or larger groups, you know, it has to perform 20 sets of those sub API requests to get all the information stored in the GraphQL and serves the end user. Um, so it can be a little more difficult to cache. Um, and, you know, just generally it's a little bit more complex, but with that complexity comes kind of the benefit of more granular fine tuned information. Now, finally here, we have kind of the ugly redheaded stepchildren of APIs, which is the RPC API, the remote procedure call API. 
Um, and so what these do is very simple, allows you to execute code on a server. Um, so in here you have just two primary types, XML RPC and JSON RPC, where you'll submit a JSON RPC request to say, call some method, you know, some piece of code you wanna write with the parameters one, two, three, and the ID, my ID. And then the response will be my result, uh, no error in serving that result to me. And that's an RPC, uh, RPC API. They are really straightforward. Just I want to execute a stored existing remote procedure, get some an, an, you know answer from that. And this is really flexible in that you know you, this stored procedure can be written in any language. This could be a SQL query. This could be a Python script. This could be a PySpark script. This could be whatever type of code or request I want to execute on that server. Uh, that just gives me a way to easily request and trigger that remotely via this RPC request. Um, I think obviously this doesn't scale as well as, GraphQ, as REST or GraphQLs. You know, you don't want to have to host all these functions uh, for people to just call to. And this is really mainly used for internal operations, internal things um, where, you know, hey, I just want to need to do a simple remote operation. I need to do a lot of times and I just want to have an endpoint so I don't have to just SSH in a machine and do it every single time. Um, so at the end of the day, kind of just tying it all together, um, the choice of your web API is really dependent on the specific requirements of your application. Uh, as you know, I hope I've made clear here where you have different balance needs of scalability, security, flexibility, simplicity. Each of those APIs uh, types really kind of offers, you know, different aspects of different of those areas. Uh, you know, REST API and GraphQLs are really suited for, you know, web services that have dynamics, complex data needs. Uh, whereas SOAP is more ideal for like, enterprise applications where you have really stringent standards, you really need high security, things like banking. Um, and then finally you have RPC calls, which are really more niche, best suited for internal systems, applications where you just need a simple remote function that you need someone to be able to trigger from an external location. Um, but at the end of the day, just understanding the strengths and limitations in each of these uh, APIs really will help you make an informed decision that aligns with your particular goals um, and technical constraints. So I hope you've learned some today. Uh, if you didn't or if you did, let me know in the comments below. Uh, but no matter what, have a great rest of your day. Data guy out. Peace.